With me today is Ruth Simmons, president of Prairie View A&M University, formerly president of Brown University, Smith College, a long resume of having worked at institutions all across the country. Uh, Prairie View is a historically black college in HBCU, founded 11 years after the end of slavery. It is such a pleasure to have you with me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Len. Good to see you. What do you think an HBCU offers that other schools don't? Oh my goodness, where, where do I begin? I, first of all, I always begin with a question like that with my own experience as an HBCU student. I grew up in Houston, uh, Houston's Fifth Ward. I went to Will Phyllis Wheatley High School and um, the systems were quite uneven in those days. And uh, I just didn't know what to make of the idea of going to college. Um, and so I went off to an HBCU and that experience gave me an opportunity to come into my own uh, as a student um, and um, as, uh, a as a citizen, frankly. Um, I think that what we try to do for our students is to give them the kind of support that enables them to firm up their identity, to understand their capability, um, to achieve beyond what they think they might even achieve. And finally, to go into the world with a sense of themselves that will propel them through the rest of their lives. So you were president of Brown University, Smith College, you've been at Princeton, USC, UNO, what a resume. Why do some black students thrive at a Prairie View and not those schools? Well, we don't know that they would not thrive at those schools, but here's the thing about um, higher education in, in this country that no other country offers basically, and that is choice. Um, if you are uh, off to college in this country, you could choose a women's college, if that feels right to you. You could choose an AMN -M university, if that seems right to you. Uh, you could choose an uh, Ivy League university, if, if you want that experience, and you could choose an HBCU. And so, uh, so I say that uh, to parents, especially, when they're looking for the right place for their children, I say to them, um, choose the place that you think is going to be right for your particular child. Because um, Lynn, we, we're not all the same. We don't all learn the same. Uh, when I think about the fact that when I left high school, I could have ended up in an institution and, and gotten lost in that institution, right? Um, instead, I went to a place that was ideal for me because coming out of Houston, never having been around whites before, never having been anywhere in the world before, and going to a place that really helped me grow up. Uh, what a gift that was. And so I think my teachers at Wheatley understood I needed that and they directed me to the right place. So we think of our HBCUs as ideal for certain students who want that kind of experience, but it's not the only experience that they could uh, enjoy. Um, it's a choice. It used to be an HBCU, Ruth, was necessary because it was one of the few options in higher education for Blacks. But it sounds as if you believe it is still necessary on some level. Explain. Uh, I would say um, it's good uh, on some level. Um, and I think in this moment, uh, first let me say that um, when I made my way into this profession, I never would have guessed that so many years later, we would be talking about the disparities between um, African Americans and, and others. I never would have guessed that. I thought the issue would have been solved by now. We see, however, in stark terms, that it is far from having been addressed. Um, if you can start with the, the Floyd um, murder and then move on to COVID and the health disparities, and then on to the political environment where votes are still, voting is still suppressed. The reality is that we are still in an environment in which uh, African-Americans have a different um, 
way of navigating the country, okay? Um, so we have a very different experience. So and what does the HBCU offer in this, in navigating the world? What does it offer for some black students that helps them more than perhaps some other institution? So um, interestingly enough, today, the students who come to us come from many different types of institutions. We have a lot of students who have been in uh, mixed uh, schools for all of their lives. So they've had the experience of um, studying alongside whites and, and, and other groups. Um, and because of that experience, they sometimes want to understand better who they are. They want to understand African-American life and culture and history because their parents sometimes tell them that will give them a good foundation for the future, okay? And so some come with that experience. Some come uh, from desperate conditions, desperate social and economic conditions. And um, like me, when I was a kid, um, they need somebody to embrace them um, who does not make assumptions about their worth or their future based on the fact that they have uh, no money. Um, and so uh, we are accustomed from our earliest days of receiving students who come from the lowest socioeconomic uh, stratum. Um, and we know how to greet them with love and respect uh, as we should for any individual in, in society, black or white or Hispanic or any other uh, human being. So I, say, I would say we're exceptionally good at that. Um, and therefore the students come in and they feel what? Valued. Now in my experience at, at uh, Brown and, and Princeton, I will say that so many African-American students would tell me that they did not feel valued, that people made comments about their unworthiness. How so? I mean, give me an example. Well, this is, this is almost a trope at this point in, in some um, uh, white institutions. There are subtle ways and sometimes quite overt ways in which in, um, uh, people are told that they don't belong, that they are unworthy. And so um, sometimes it's pretty uh, systematic actually. Uh, and students feel that way on the campus in the way people react to them. They feel that way in their classes because they might get a professor who uh, suggests to them that they're really not very smart and they don't belong there. And they ask them questions like, well, how did you ever get into this university? Uh, uh, and so on. So, so um, they feel bombarded by those kinds of comments uh, often. And um, it not, has not been unusual in our history for individuals to leave those institutions um, feeling defeated, uh, feeling less than what they should be. I'll never forget one student uh, told me, one graduate, uh, and I won't say what institution told me, that when he went into the corporate world, he learned to shrink himself um, so that he would not be seen as threatening as a black male in the corporate culture. Um, that's something he learned from his, um, his experience at a university. So uh, people, students often ask me, Ruth, how, why, how did you learn to be so, so outspoken and to, to speak your mind? And I always say, well, it was my undergraduate college because when I went to college, um, I was terrible. I mean, Lynn, I would, I would, I can't believe that. I was, I mean, I, I just, I, I would attack everything. Um, the administration practices, everything. So I was quite outspoken, but they did not drum that out of me. Uh, and over time, I learned how to be assertive and how to be outspoken without offending people because I was given the chance to mature in a safe environment in which people did not tell me I was a horrible person. Uh, and so on. So when I left um, my historically black college and I went off to Harvard, there was nobody at Harvard who could have deterred me. No one because of my HBCU experience. Mm. 
You have watched more than a generation of young people at schools all across the country. Attitudes on race have surely improved, but why is it that we seem to take two steps forward and one step back? I, I've come to think uh, that um, we were naive in thinking that mere access would solve the problem, uh, mere um, uh, inclusion would solve the problem because we never got to the underlying issues. And the underlying issues are pretty clear. And that is, there's a, there's a long tradition um, in this country of, um, of uh, assuming that Blacks are less than. Um, our institution was created in that framework uh, because we were to be the institution uh, for um, individuals who were less than, mm -hmm. okay? Well, what happens when you do that, Lynn? What happens is that all of the policies and practices and the support you get are in line with that kind of thinking. So you may open access, but if you don't change the underlying stereotyping and, and the attitude. bias, then you're going to continue that along the way. And so I think what is what we're now learning uh, is that we have not done the work we should have done. Um, and I think we haven't because this issue of race has been so painful for us in this country, uh, given our history. And we don't like to talk about it and we don't like to confront the reality. And yet, I think we know now, if we don't confront it, we'll never get beyond it. So I think there's a lot of hard work going on now in universities, in the corporate world, um, and, and in government to try to come to terms with those underlying issues. A few months ago, the Board of Regents announced, as we talk about this issue, the Ruth J. Simmons Center for Race and Justice. Clearly, I, we all know what the purpose is. What is the plan here? Well, the plan is um, underway as we speak. Uh, and let me say this um, about, uh, about the center. I never imagined when we announced that we were going to do this work. And again, the underlying work of getting at the issues and helping society deal with the real issues and bringing solutions to that. I never imagined that it would hit such a chord. But it did, and we have so many corporations and organizations that have piled on insisting that they want to be a part of our center. And I'm very grateful to them for that. So what, what are we doing? Uh, well, we are um, tackling the most difficult issue, and that is we're, we're talking about race, and we're talking about its relationship to fairness in society. Uh, what are the reasons that we've come um, this path. How do we untangle what we have done and move in a different direction um, in a way that will be lasting? Uh, and so our goal is to present policy papers, uh, to answer questions about the meaning of all of this, because we have scholars and, and, and experts on this issue who studied it, uh, and they can tell us why we are behaving the way we are and why this has not been solved. We can work with the criminal justice system and police departments to help them understand why the persistence of these kinds of um, differences that uh, officers sometimes make uh, between uh, different groups. Uh, we can help our students understand what they are going to be facing. Nobody ever helped me, and I wonder if they helped you when you were a student understand and be prepared for the fact of what you were gonna face in, you, in your life and in your profession. Did anybody ever say to you, um, well, you know, you may encounter moments where people will say to you um, that you're, you're not worthy of a particular job or you're not qualified to do something. Um, I think our students have never really been given a chance to understand that this is a long process. Um, and here's what I have tried to do in my career and I want my students to do at Prairie View. I don't want them to walk away. I don't want them to give up. I don't want them to be discouraged. I want them to be willing to teach uh, people they encounter 
Uh, I want them to be willing to respond instead of turning away. Uh, because uh, turning away has not solved this problem for us. I think we can see that now. And what I've always tried to do in my career when people said things to me, um, I've always tried to engage. Um, I remember when I first started at Brown, a gentleman came in to see me, a very important donor to the university. Um, and he said he was very concerned about the, the number of minorities at Brown and he wanted it to stop. Really? Uh, and, and um, well, people are, are, if you are self-confident, you can be quite bold in your bias and you can expound on it uh, to a fairly well. And so um, I, I listened to him and I said, well, obviously uh, I don't agree with you. Uh, so let's work together to see how you can understand the role of the university and what these individuals bring to the university. And we did. Um, and over time, we became uh, good friends. That's the work we have to do in this country. We, don't, we cannot walk away, even in the face of those kinds of objectionable comments. We have to confront it. We have to educate people. So I it don't sounds see like way. it's, it, let me wrap around what, what you just said, and I think it's yes. very important. It sounds like this Ruth Center for Justice and Equality is about not confrontation, but a conversation. Uh, yes, yes, indeed, but, uh, and learning, right? Um, so for example, we have something called an activist in residence. Now, you know, we're very elitist in the university world. We think if, you know, if you don't have a PhD and if you didn't go to this place and that place, you know, can you actually teach? But here's the thing that's very important for our students. There are incredible people who have transformed society, transformed society um, in activist roles. And we don't put them in front of our students. So we uh, want to have activists in residence who can help us understand the ways in which they have um, continued their activism, the ways that they have formulated paths to change and so forth. Imagine somebody like John Lewis sitting with students um, and telling them why he persisted all of those years and how he, how he managed to um, avoid disappointment uh, and so forth. That, so we want to give that to our community, uh, to have them come and listen to people like that. Because all of us must be activists for truth and activists for justice, all of us. It's everybody's duty. And I want every student who leaves uh, Prairie View to feel that they have the tools to be able to do that. Mm. You got a million dollars for the Ruth Simmons Center for Justice and Equality from the chairman of HEB. Yes. You got 50 million from the philanthropist Mackenzie Scott. What, why do you think all of this is happening now for the university? I think we are in a moment where people are, have come, are coming to terms with the fact that the rosy picture we painted for ourselves of opportunity for all um, and the progress our country has made over more than 250 years, I think people are coming to see that, that that's a veneer that can easily come undone. And what people are trying to do is to go to where the work is being done, go to the source in a sense. Where is the work being done? How can we affect lasting change? And so I think all of the HBCUs are experiencing a kind of revival, actually, after going through so many decades with um, minimal funding um, and with uh, little support, I think uh, everybody is getting the attention that has been long deserved uh, for what they have been doing to move people through these uh, challenges and to have them come out on the other side, like a Kamala Harris. I mean, what makes a Kamala Harris able to take everything, all the abuse she's going to take, okay? All of the changes she's been through. Um, what enables her to be able to do that? And when people look at it and say, oh, well, she went to Howard University and she flourished and she gained the confidence to go forward and to become um, a, a, a lawyer, 
and, and then to hold public office. There must be something there. Let's look at it and see what there is. So uh, the university model for a long time has been, okay, are you bright enough? Are you good enough? Come in, you'll be given a chance, go through, and if you fail, so what, okay? Uh, HBCUs have necessarily had to follow a different path of wrapping our arms around students, encouraging them in the face of what they go through in society and enabling them uh, to soar. And so I think that's part of it as well. 